<laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to DEF CON. My name is Dr. Bramwell Brizendine. I am the director of the Verona Lab, which deals with vulnerability research, creator of the Shell Wasp, which allows us to utilize Windows syscalls in shell code. I've created the Jop Rocket and Rop Rocket, both of which deal with return oriented programming and jump oriented programming. And I've also created an NSA funded research project called Sherem, which allows us to analyze uh, shell code. Uh, I've spoken at many different conferences in the past. Um, and I'm also an assistant professor of cybersecurity. I have a PhD in cyber operations, which is a highly technical degree. And all of those uh, previous projects have um, previously been presented at DEF CON, so check them out. My co speaker is uh, Shiva Shashank Kusama. He is a research assistant and uh, he has a master's in computer science and is pursuing a master's in cybersecurity. Uh, he's looking for internship opportunities for the summer as well. So, our agenda what are we going to focus on? Well, firstly, we'll talk briefly about a general approach to shell codeless ROP. How do we create unique patterns to facilitate process injection? Some generic ROP techniques for process injection. And then we will look at a sample process injection technique that has a uh, highly novel solution to a rather significant problem. We'll have a demo and then we'll have another brief uh, uh, process injection and we'll, we, we will conclude. So some uh, preliminary words on our experiment. Now this, when we, we conducted this research, we did it on a contrived binary, uh, one that is intentionally vulnerable and is filled with convenient gadgets because we want our work to be applicable not just to one particular vulnerable binary, but to potentially uh, any binary. So we want to discover everything that is possible. And this research is really focused on uh, ROP from the standpoint of you compromise a binary. It's not something where we're trying to integrate ROP in some kind of custom malware or some kind of custom red team software. So let's introduce the idea of shell code with ROP. What does it mean exactly? Well, it's this idea of instead of uh, bypassing data execution prevention DEP, we are instead going to in invoke the uh, functionality of a shell code directly via ROP gadgets. And it's something that has very seldom been done in the Windows ecosystem. And when you see it, it's almost always two, three APIs chained together. But you'll see uh, later today that we have uh, vastly uh, more APIs to achieve what we want to do. Some also uh, some previous work on Shell Cola's job. There's a video link in the slides, so I do encourage you to uh, check it out if you're interested. So, in terms of approaching Shell Cola's job, there or Shell Cola's ROP, there are a couple approaches we could take. One is utilizing push add, where we're going to populate values on uh, certain registers uh, with certain predefined values, um, and then that causes them to be loaded onto the stack in a, a certain predefined order. And we'll also use move dereference or the sniper technique and this allows us to precisely write our values to the stack and we can then increment or decrement to the next uh, slot that we want to provide values for. So those are both critically uh, important for us. And I want to reemphasize the importance of this idea of finding patterns because again we're not really just approaching one process injection technique but we want our work to be applicable broadly to many different techniques. How do we do this in terms of return oriented programming? So we really want to emphasize that you know we have these particular slots uh, where we have uh, registers going in a certain order. Uh, so we really uh, weaponize this in terms of developing new patterns for different APIs uh, both Windows APIs as well as native APIs to allow us to invoke those easily using return oriented programming. So and when using many different APIs we want to be able to chain them together. Lar kind of like in the sense where you have a, a, a ROP chain, you have different uh, ROP gadgets chained together, we'll be chaining different APIs together. So you may get one uh, return value, uh, in this case uh, open process runtime address, is provided to us in EAX. We can use that subsequently in a pattern for open process because of course we need to call open process. 
So a large part of our research is really focused on generating a lot of these different types of patterns. And actually we've de developed more than 150 unique patterns to provide a lot of opportunities. Um, We'll talk more in depth about some of them and we'll give some examples. But historically, uh, some of the tools that have done this have been things like uh, Mona, Mona, you know, of Virtual Alloc, Virtual Protect, and you have a couple patterns. So it's not a significant number of patterns. So let's talk now briefly about some generic ROP techniques that we can use to help us with uh, process injection. So one is the idea of using function output, using that function output as a way to um, to be a parameter. So get proc address and little library often go hand in hand and they're very familiar and are well known. Uh, so with a little library, we can get a handle to a module, uh, which is the, the base address of a certain DLL and that's required for get proc address. So we take the output from the one, which is gonna be returned to us in EAX and then we use that subsequently in uh, get proc address. And we'll do this time and time again, so return values as well as other out parameters if you're dealing with native APIs. And then this gets a little bit more complex, so structures is parameters. Can we do that with return oriented programming? And we actually can. So with a structure, we need to look clearly at the, the definition of the structure, and then we need to build that byte by byte through return-oriented programming, and we'll typically do that with a series of move dereferences, and we can just increment and decrement to the, to the next slot as we slowly build our, uh, our structure. And in some cases, we may actually have nested structures, so take a look at adjust token privileges. We have several nested structures, and it needs to be done exactly correctly or else it simply <laughs> will just not work. Um, one thing that is also uh, immensely important is this idea of storing important values, um, addresses, handles, things which may be obtained by calling a Windows API. If we call a Windows API to obtain one of these values, well, that takes a lot of effort. And if we needed it again, well, of course, we don't want to call it a second time. So we will make an effort to save that value somewhere in memory and then we can retrieve it later. So we might have a common reference point. We move ESP to a location, maybe we advance four or 500 bytes and we just start writing different values there. And that common uh, reference point can, will change from gadget to gadget, but we can manually calculate that and make adjustments uh, as need be. So again, you'll have lots of important values and you can save them and then retrieve them subsequently uh, later on. So one other thing we did is, and this is actually uh, completely novel, combining move dereference and push add in terms of building a pattern. So we can use that to create a, a, a ROP chain pattern. Uh, push add, you can have a maximum of four parameters, five if you use ESP, but that can be rather uh, challenging to do. Um, so we can do push add and then do the remainder, we can supply those via move dereference. Now, if you have the option to uh, place your strings and data in the payload directly, then by all means do it because it's gonna save you effort. Again, if you have a common reference point, you can use these, you have a pointer to a string. And you, some of you might be saying, well, what about EDR? Well, yes, EDR will be an issue at times and so this may not always be plausible. If you have no payload size restrictions, one option is to obfuscate some of this and then you could use a ROP to go and deobfuscate it as need be. So let's get into an actual uh, process injection technique. Now this is based on something that I actually did at Hack in the Box Amsterdam 2023. That was all Windows syscalls and shell code. This obviously is not, it, it's return oriented programming. And so these are more, uh, these are Windows APIs and native APIs. It's not necessarily strikingly original. Um, but in any case, we have a new URL. We're gonna create that. It's gonna slither up inside of our victim target an external process and then we're gonna write our shell code there and then cause it to launch. So in terms of ROP, the actual complete chain of gadgets that we have, 29 gadgets. It's an extraordinary amount. Uh, I'm not familiar with any uh, ROP chain in the, in the Windows ecosystem that has anywhere near this level of gadgets. And so there's a lot of work to, to maintain these from, um, from API, API call to API call. And it would be a lot more actually if we did not use that technique of storing and retrieving certain values that we need. 
So let's talk about load library. We can use that with a uh, push add and a, a pattern. So we load the particular values into uh, registers and then we go and do push add. Then that causes it to go in a predefined uh, location. And so let's see what happens exactly. So we, we have our stack values there and those correspond to our pattern. So we have red eight, where that means we're gonna do this ROP NOP. We're gonna skip eight bytes. So we skip that, we do a jump EVP dereference. We therefore invoke load library. We have a return address, we have a parameter. Everything checks out. And then we get a result, exact result that we want. So we get the base address of NTDLL. And then we can use that subsequently for git proc address, which, which is our next one. And we'll do the same thing. We'll populate different values into the registers. We can then call push add. And we get the runtime address. In this case, we're doing create tool help 32 snapshot. An extremely important thing that we'll talk about momentarily. So these are the patterns for load library. We have a lot of them, nine. And git proc address, we have 11. So that gives us a lot of flexibilities because if you're trying to do something, you don't have a particular gadget, well, you just give up. If you do, then the chain is incomplete. But having multiple patterns, we can drill down deeper and maybe find something that actually works. In any case, our next API is create tool help 32 snapshot, which will allow us to take a snapshot of all the active processes that are out there. And it's immensely important. We need it to discover uh, the different PIDs. We're gonna target one of those. So there are actually 11 patterns, so a lot of flexibility there in terms of how you can invoke it with the push add instruction. Um, there's an example of the ROP, and we got the push add at the bottom. Virtual alloc, um, it's one way to allocate memory. Yes, some EDR can block it. There are other ways you could do it. Uh, the pattern for that is very uh, familiar. Uh, one, of the, one of the most familiar goes back probably about 15 years. Um, but with this, we're gonna allocate a region of memory. We're gonna use that for a couple of very uh, important uh, things. One of which is to build the process entry 32. The process entry 32 is where we're going to go in and check our PID and we're gonna check our uh, string. So the first thing is gonna be process 32 first. It's gonna kick everything off. It's gonna initiate the whole uh, process. So how we're gonna do that? Uh, first, we actually need to build the structure. So we can go ahead and build the structure via ROP and our move dereferences. Most of it are no bytes, so it's relatively simple. We have a DW size. Uh, it's an arbitrary value, so you can make it whatever you want. And then once we're done, we get a pointer to that. We supply that pointer as the parameter. So all of that work, and we just get a pointer to that. So again, the idea of being able to uh, dynamically locate something in memory and use that as kind of like a pointer can be very useful. And then the, the patterns for process 32 first and process 32 next are actually interchangeable. So one of the biggest challenges is this idea of string comparison. How do we do that with ROP? Well, the gadgets are not really very common, so that can be very uh, problematic. We need to identify a specific process, otherwise you really can't proceed forward. So you're kind of at a, an, uh, <laughs> You can't really go forward without this. So we came up with a solution. We're gonna build our own custom function in memory. It's an enumerate process function. And we're actually writing the raw assembly. So remember we made a writable memory with virtual alloc, we can write our code there. You could do it other ways as well. And so this will cycle through process 32 next. It could do it hundreds of times. It'll loop until it finds the exact uh, string, view player. We can supply that. And then once it does that, it'll go ahead and exit out. So how do we write that? Well, we simply just compile it. We can then write our bytes to memory using the move dereference technique one by one until they're all written. Make sure the code is executable and there are multiple ways in which you can do that. And then we need to supply the appropriate values. So things like our HP snapshot, our, our VU player string, uh, dereference process 32 address. And then how do we kick it off? Uh, again, multiple ways, but in this case, we're gonna do a simple push ret, which will then push the address onto the stack and then return to that, and then we can uh, immediately start executing our custom code that we just wrote there. And so that'll invoke process 32 uh, repeatedly until it finds our particular PID. In this case, we have view player. It's gonna look at offset 24, and once it finds offset 24, then again, it's gonna break out of that loop and um, from there, the base of the structure, we can just go to simply offset eight. Offset eight will then hold the PID. We can capture that PID. In this case, it's 668. 
And how do we do that via return oriented programming? Well, we just basically take exactly what I said, translate it to ROP. So some move dereferences, some pops, a uh, sequence of eight uh, increments. And uh, in this case, we have a different PID, B9, eight, and uh, we can supply that, uh, we can save that to memory so we can use that later, remember the idea of save and then retrieve. And then that brings us to our next API, and with that we're gonna have Shiva uh, take the podium. Here we take this PID that we just obtained after all of that hard work, and uh, we are going to convert that into the handle to the process. We gotta have this. It's impossible to move forward if you don't have a PID to your target process. And we don't want to just randomly inject into some other unknown process. Uh, so this one we are going to use both push add as well as Moody reference technique. So here we have multiple patterns for open process. And then we'll follow that up of, after push add. And we also have a Moody reference with the process ID. In this ROP chain, the process ID has been provided by Moody reference uh, with everything else being done via push add. Next, we'll open a handle to our current process with open process token. And then we'll use that. So right here, we have a handle. And we are using ROP to create a pointer to hold the access token that we'll retrieve. With adjust token privileges, uh, we are going to take that token handle and we can then change the privileges as we need. We need to do this to avoid some problems that could happen otherwise. And this requires multiple complex structures, such as token privileges, such as uh, where, where we can specify the SC privilege enabled and SC debug privilege. With adjust token privileges, uh, here we have a rob. So we are setting disable all privileges to false. And what that means is that whatever we specify inside the new state structure will be then done. With adjust token privileges, we can then go inspect via the debugger and see if it has all of our values, like SC privilege enabled and SC debug privilege. And then everything is going according to the plan. Our goal with these is to take a common DLL URL mon, create a file for it, and then go ahead and map that out. And then we can inject our payload into that, then causing that to be executed. And we'll do this with these APIs, which we'll be talking about. So create file A is the first. We get a handle to the URL mon, which is our file. We are going to be using this later on, uh, but we are going to do this with sequence of Moody references. And here we are providing the absolute address, the string pointer to that, and also generic read. We are doing generic read to avoid some possible detections. And then NT create section, a lower level native API, will allow us to then create a section object for URL mon DLL. And here we are doing page read only. And then with Rob, we are specifying the sec image. NT map view of section. Now that we have the URL mon section handle, we can now map that view of the section into address space of view player. We'll do this purely through Moody references because uh, we have many nulls and also we have page read only. So it's a bit more limited. One more important thing is providing the base address or pointer to the base address. And that will receive a base address inside of view player. So that will be provided to us, as you can see in this example, which we'll be talking about later. So it is very important. Virtual protect EX will then allow us to change the target DLL URL mon to RWX. And so we are going to do this with sequence of Moody references, because remember, we had limited permissions for it. And so we'll get the handle to the VU player as well as the base address that we just retrieved. And then once it's done, we'll have the page execute read write. Here is the row where we can provide the pointer to the base address. We then go and dereference that, and we'll pull the base address out of that. And then we do the Moody reference. Write process memory allows us to inject the shell code into the process memory of VU player. We are doing this via push add as well as Moody references, which you can see right here. So pointing to the shell code up there, and also providing the size. Same thing here. We, are, we have the shell code and the size, and then the remaining parameters with push add. 
write process memory at this point. Once this done, then our shell code will be injected into inside of URL mon, which is an external process. So we have gone from one process to a completely different process, and the shell code is just sitting there waiting for us. So how do we cause it to execute? The answer is very simple. It's create remote thread, but the actual technique is not so simple. So we'll have a Moody reference and also push out pattern, and then we'll have a sequence of Moody references. We'll go inside the other space of VU player, and then we do the push out. So here is some of our Rob. We can provide the LP parameter as well as the address, and then we follow that up after push out. And finally, with create remote thread, our injected shell code will execute. We have achieved our goal. Let's do a demo. We start the things with create help 32 snapshot, and we have been given a handle. Let's write the enum process function to memory byte by byte. We invoke the function using push rat. Now we are inside the function, special function that we created. And let's check the process entry. Let's see what we have as the first entry. We have system. Let's move forward until we find our desired PID. And we finally found the PID for VU player. That's good. We'll keep moving forward. And we'll do the create file A. We'll get a handle from create file A. Let's verify what we have. We have the URL mount. That's good. Let's map that out using NTMAP UF section. And let's check the base address. Right now, we don't have any base address. But right after the function execution, we'll get the base address. And base address has been provided. We'll change the permissions for the base address. And we'll see. Yeah, we have the page execute reader permissions. We have the MZ, it's a PE file, and let's inject the shell code using write process memory. And let's see what we have. We have successfully injected the shell code into external process. You got a wrap. Yeah, no demo. And finally, create remote thread. We got it. Thank you, Shiva. So we're going to wrap things up very briefly here. So I just want to say uh, the argument, you know, our goal is not to enumerate all process inject injection techniques. We've seen talks like that before, but we really want to provide a methodology in terms of how we can do that with ROP and focus on the practicalities. We want to provide a novel concept of building a new enumerate processes function purely via ROP, which can be extendable to other process injection techniques, and then create a, a rich set of patterns that we can utilize for that purpose. Uh, with that, we'd like to thank you and uh, invite you to check out the, the ROP Rocket tool.